Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Um, let me welcome you this morning. Um, my name is Michael Self, and uh, I uh, will not have a lengthy introduction. Uh, the introductions to Ustaz Gamal and uh, to Ustaz Farouk um, are on the cards. Um, I hope you've all been able to get one. You're in the back of the room. And the program is on the cards. Uh, so Ustaz Gamal and Ustaz Farouk among us are uh, Mahmoud and do not need um, any introduction. Time is precious, so we will spend it um, reading, uh, enjoying translations, and discussing practice and writing. It's very unusual to have a professor of the practice, and I've thought about what that means. And um, the, uh, this whole set today of events is set up to be a extended enjoyment of the word, of the written word, the art of writing, the practice of writing, and the art of translation. And. Uh, uh, let me just say a, a few words about uh, the art of translation first. I was thinking about uh, what uh, translation is um, beyond what we'll be celebrating when we read uh, in the first panel passages from uh, the works of Ustaz Kamal um, in the translations of Peru himself. Translator, without a translation, without a translator, without the act of translate, translating. Um, looking back on the thought of some of the writing models that uh, uh, Kamala Vitani has used, I think that one moment could not connect to another. Uh, one place could not connect to another. And no one could connect to anyone else. Without the translator, we would all be very alone. And um, there are many translators involved uh, in this program. Uh, there's the Mellon Foundation, which uh, has many people here working to make events like this possible. Uh, there's Robin uh, Winget, or Winget, is it Winget or Winget? I'm not sure. Uh, we, will, we will check on her name, who has been designing the art for these events with extraordinary ability. There's Bill Jirasi, who is the person that allows our audio to talk to our video and our, um, our various selves to connect one another through technology and has set up the technology here so that we can have this, these readings preserved. Um, and of course, um, there's uh, Farouk uh, Mustafa and later uh, Cameron Cross uh, will be discussing their own work in translation. Our first event will have uh, a rapid fire series of readings from the translation and then to the uh, Stats Kamal. I will signal to the Stats Kamal when we can begin reading after a certain amount of translation. And we will have different voices reading. Um, uh, voice A, voice B, voice C, and voice D. Um, we hope to be nice energies that allow the, uh, the momentum to carry forward. And it's a great pleasure to introduce um, Professor K. Heikkinen, um, who, as well as all the other Arabic faculty here, um, have the uh, have have contributed so incredible to um, the joy of learning Arabic, 
and um, the immersion in Arabic for um, untold students. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Kay, and then uh, Kay will say a few words. And then the readers will come up here, um, uh, and then we'll uh, start. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm glad to see you. I really appreciate you coming in an early hour and a gray, cold, rainy day. I, it puts me in mind of Farouk, who once in a uh, liberal idea said, well, I only decided to do it last Wednesday. And so I'm doing the things I can do without thinking much, because I don't like to think in this weather. And most of it. <laughs> so it's all the more vodka that you, you will have come um, in this walk that Mosaic should have I didn't uh, know or remember that I was going to say much, so I thought I would just give you a few thoughts about Farouk since I know him well. I think you all know that, that he was my husband these last few years. These are just a few that you are yet. There are others. Some of you may have different ones completely from the ones that I'm going to give you. But that's what happens with heavy, right? We all talk about what we remember, <laughs> and then other people talk, and then they will have the feeling, have the feeling have to come later and figure out which one is, is right. Um, his work began, of course, translating uh, from uh, English or other languages into Arabic. He did a translation of Henry IV and um, Another one uh, that I forget now, another play. He was very, always very, very interested in the theater. That was his main focus when he was in Cairo. He was a student in Cairo. Um, and that's the normal thing that a translator will do, right? They'll translate into the language of which you are the, the child. Uh, but then when he came to the University of Minnesota, of course, he was studying in English. And as a part of his doctoral work, he translated a number of plays into English and began to uh, as well as doing scholarly work on them and analyzing them and so on, a number of Egyptian plays, and began to think about the importance of translation, as uh, Michael has said. But he went on with his teaching and his, his uh, academic work until the opportunity came for him to translate a Zeni Barakat. And the story, as I have heard it, is that it was considered to be an untranslatable text because of how uh, of the beautiful language in it and all the various registers of language and um, uh, references and so on. But the Edward Said apparently had happened on his translations of the plays and said, you know, there's someone I think can do this. So he had the opportunity to translate Azini Barakat and fell in love with Gemini Khatani's writing and with translation. And in his, his great uh, love for it, immediately sat down to do um, immediately and did a, a, a manuscript of that, but discovered that if you don't have a contract ahead of time, doing the translation does not necessarily mean that it will be published. He learned this lesson and passed it on with great fervor to anyone who was listening. Uh, uh, and then uh, but he began to see that people were really enjoying that text, and it, he had enormous pleasure in that. He said, they give it to each other for gifts. And then sometimes he would say, well, of course, I've done the reading for them, so it's easier. Um, he, he took enormous pleasure in that. So he began to translate more and more and saw it um, in the light of, of creativity and artistic performance. That is, his taking one set of language and rendering it in another. And um, also under the light of the communication between people. I found an interview with him in al Haram, I believe, uh, from many years ago, in which the, his major thread was, we must communicate, we must give our literature to people who don't read Arabic so that they can understand uh, the rage of our civilization. Long before 9-11 was thought of, uh, long before Samuel Huntington conceived his thought. So under these, the, the dual um, impetus, impeti, impetuses, of um, his, his own the creative work and of wanting to bring uh, great literature to uh, readers of English, he continued to translate it. By the time I came into his life, there were um, uh, myths and stories about his legendary translation thoughts. 
he would tend to do it during the summer, and he would go into Moscow, go into translation camp, where he would exist largely on chocolate and coffee. Uh, and the occasional other uh, bit of sustenance here and there, maybe ramen noodles or something equally oh, nutritious. Uh, and then he would accomplish a first draft in a huge rush, always by hand, always with a fountain pen. Um, he believed in that. He would tell me which of his students translate by hand, with a pen, the way they should, um, in his classes. And then he would, he would think about precision and exactly how you render one idea in a completely different, different medium. Um, that's most of what I have to say, except that the, as, as I knew him, what he cared most about um, in, uh, in that part of his life was, was two things. One, uh, the power of the word, which we're going to, to celebrate now, and the importance of bringing it in a way that is beautiful and understandable across, uh, not just bringing the meanings into another language, but bringing the meaning and something of its clothing into another language. And then the other thing that he cared most about, perhaps even a little more, uh, was his students. And the power of, the multi multiplicative power of the willing mind of students. He took enormous pleasure in being able to claim that uh, Michael had once uh, been his student. Mm -hmm. And from every, every student of his, from there on, he remembered and cared about and believed in their, uh, their continuing the idea of the power of the word and uh, uh, translating it in the fullest sense one uh, message from one uh, medium uh, to another. That was for because I knew him uh, with translation, but as I say, there are many other, uh, many other uh, kinds of memories, some of them probably contradictory. I did not have all the details straight. Uh, but the, that was the, that was what I remembered of him. So in terms of the power of the word, we'd like to, uh, to do some readings now. Readings that from three of, uh, three of um, Ustaz Gamal's uh, books, which Farouk translated as Eni Barakat, the, um, the Zafarani Tales, as he named it, and uh, the, the Book of Epiphanies from the first volume. And of course, we're not about to summarize three deep and complex novels in a few minutes, but we thought that it would be a, a nice idea to take um, passages that show different kinds of writing and types of expression and give a flavor of them uh, in English and then in Java. So we'll start that now. Thank you. So um, could I ask you to, uh, could I ask the voices of um, uh, Ustaz uh, Gamal and Farouk um, uh, to come up. Uh, to, uh, they will be the readers. And um, uh, once we uh, read, once we read a particular section, I will turn to uh, Ustaz Kamal, and he will read um, uh, the original, and then uh, offer a couple thoughts on um, how he came uh, to this particular uh, moment in in discourse in life. So. We are going to begin uh, with some readings from uh, Zaidi Barakat. Uh, I will be one of the readers. Uh, let me begin. Excerpt C from the observations of the Venetian traveler. Uh, uh, Visconti Gianti, who arrived in Cairo for the second time in 917 AH. Stayed there for some time, traveling to Syria and Hejaz, and then returned to Cairo and stayed there. By this time, he had learned the, uh, the language of the country and no longer needed an Arabic translator. Dul Pada, 928. I didn't put on the garb of a Turkish merchant, 
especially since the people of the police have been seeking out every item they could catch. At best, they would hand him over to the chief spy of the state to punish him severely and make him confess what information he was assigned to gather and send to the audience. I went on holding a short stick, then off the dogs. I saw the city seething. It is rare to see people, especially women, out after supper in Oriental cities, especially Cairo, which is kept in order by a strong man, very religious and greatly respected by the people, who is the object of this seething. I mean, Zadie Barakat. No one has more longevity in his post than him, even though conditions here are very volatile. A man may assume a post in the evening and lose that very post the following morning. I saw, I saw torturers here hanging only in front of the shops. I saw an old man sitting next to an old wall. I see him in the daytime and at night, absolutely motionless as if he were a stone conclusion in the shape of a man. I remember having seen him on my previous visit. He doesn't change. I wish I could watch him to see when he eats, when he loosens his grip on the stick. But that woman is sitting in front of a big crate on which parsley and watercress are displayed. A man is selling a delicious pastry made of flour, butter, and sugar, which the Orientals love and which they call best person. A number of people in Cairo are famous for being good at making it. Of these, I remember a man who is short and has one bad eye. Before summer, he goes out of his house to an alley inhabited only by herb and spice merchants. He would stand there, expressionless, as men and women wrong about it. None of them speaks loudly. If a person were to raise his voice, urging him to hurry up with his order, but he never sells it, even if it came back to him several times. He uses a short knife which has a wide triangular blade to cut the busters. The movements of his hand are deliberate and precise, as if he were shaking gold and sculpting alabaster. The tray would become empty except for some sweet crumbs that glisten on the top of a thin layer of uh, that glisten on the top of a thin layer of butter like golden rays. He would gather the crumbs with the knife in the corner of the tray. The moment he has finished gathering them, a tall thin man with a band around his eyes walks noiselessly and carrying a little child who does not cry comes. The center gives him the crumbs wrapped in a piece of paper. Then he places the wooden triangular stand under his arm and reads. I like standing here watching his hands and his expressionless face. I, have, I haven't gone to him yet. All the food shops are open. As you walk in front of them, you hear the chatter of plates and pots and pans and stuff, aroma of the different dishes, fried fish, chicken stuffed with onions, meat pies that are made of dough shaped like triangles filled with meat and fried and clarified butter until they turn around. From a distance, a climber arose, approached, then turned. A group of carpenters is riding in carts drawn by animals. They were cheering and shouting rhythmically, Edna Mosa, Edna Mosa. I couldn't make out the rest of what they were saying. From time to time, thundering shouts made by a group would rise to a roar. Then their words would be scattered and lost in confusion and stop. I hear someone saying, Ibn Mosa doesn't come twice in the same era. Another said, if someone came to do good by them, they must find fault with him. Strangely enough, yesterday I heard an old man at an old apothecary shop in Kanzawi say, the fact that Ibn Mosa has appeared is a sign of the imminent destruction of the world. I don't know things about him that would make your hair stand on him. But those present looked at him, fell silent for a moment, then tried to outdo each other in praising Ibnusa, as if fending off some hidden evil, as if negating having listened to the old man. What a perplexing affair. I haven't seen anything like it in any country. The people love a specific person. Everybody says good things about him, praises him. But at the same time, there is a secret undercurrent 
an imperceptible feeling permeating people and even inanimate objects. A fear of seeing, which does not show on anyone's face, but which can be felt. This has really puzzled and confused me. Ms. Dabbs come out, if you'd like to uh, come up and read us that passage. Ms. Dabbs come out, would you like to come up and read us that passage? <laughs> شكرا استاذ مايكل شكرا للاصدقاء الاعزاء على هذه الفرصه وهذا اللقاء اللطفي لسه جديد وقبل ان اقرا كل ما ساقراه اليوم مهدى إلى روح الأخ والصديق وصاحب الفضل الدكتور فاروق عبد الوهاب. So thanks for uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks for everyone, thanks for this fruitful uh, meeting. All that we are going to read today is dedicated to the soul and memory of uh, my brother, my friend uh, Faruk al في الزي بركات شخصية رحالة إفارة بندق ومتخير و بعض الأصدقاء الإيطاليين من القراء طلبوني بأصل الرحلة. الرحلة غير حقيقية. يعني أنا تخيلت هذا الرحالة وألفت الاسم من فيسكونتي من اسم مخرج شهير وجنتي هو رسام عاش في القرن السادس عشر ورسم السلطان الغوري في لوحه مشهوره موجوده الان في متحف الملك. So uh, in the Zini Barakir there is a fictional character of the traveler from Venice. Some of my fans asked me about this journey. If it's historical, I and mean, I say it's, it's a fictional character, everything is imagined and uh, fictional. Shukriya. <laughs> عام 917 هجرية وأقام بها ثم رحل إلى الشام وبلاد الحجاز ثم عاد إلى القاهرة وأقام بها وفي هذه المرة كان قد تعلم لغة أهل البلاد فلم يعد لحاجة إلى مترجم عربي لم أرتدي ملابس تاجر تركي خاصة والأهالي والشرطة يتعقبون كل عثماني ربما أمسكوه يسلمونه في أحسن الأحوال إلى كبير بصاص الدولة ليعاقبه عقابا مريرا ليقر أي معلومات كلف بجمعها وارسالها الى ابن عثمان. نزلت ممسكا عصا قصيره ادفع بها هذا الكلاب عني. رايت المدينه تفلي 
من النادر جدا توازن الاهالي خاصة النساء بعد العشاء في طرقات المدن الشرقية خاصة القاهرة التي يشرف على نظامها رجل قوي متمسك بالدين وفروضه له هيبة عظيمة عند الناس وهو محور هذا الغلاء أقصد الزين بركات لا يعمر رجل مثله في وظيفته مع أن الأوضاع هنا سريعة التقلب وهناك من يتولى منصبا في المساء ليخلع في الصباح رأيت المشاعر معلقة أمام الدكاتين فقط رأيت عجوزا يجلس بجوار جدار قديم أراه في الليل والنهار لا يرعش طرفا كأنه بروز حجري على هيئة إنسان وأذكر أنني رأيته في زيارات السابقة لا يتغير بودي لو أرقبه أعرف متى يأكل متى يفك قبضته عن العصا امرأة بدينة تجلس أمام قفص كبير فوقه البطرونس والكبير رجل يبيع حلوى لذيذة الطعم من الدقيق والسمن والسكر يحبها أهل الشرق اسمها بسبوسة اشتهرت في القاهرة عدد من الباعة يتقنون صناعتها أذكر منهم رجلا قصير القامة أعور قبل المغرب يخرج من بيته إلى ناحية حارة لا يسكنها إلا العطارون يقف جامدا يتوافد إليه الناس رجالا وأطفالا ونساء لا يزعق أحدهم إذا على صوت رجل يطلب الإسراع لتلبية طلبه هنا ينظر إليه ويشير إشارة واحدة للجزء امشي ولا يمكن أن يبيع له أبدا حتى لو تردد عليه مرة وعندما يقطع البسبوسة يمد يده بسكينة قصيرة سلاح عريض مثلث حركة يده مقسومة محددة كأنه يشكل الذهب ينحت المرة تخلو الصينية إلا من فتاة حلو متناسب يلمع فوق طبقة رقيقة من السم كالأشعة الصفراء بالسكين يجمع الفتاة يلمه إلى حافة الصينية في اللحظة التي ينتهي من تجميعه يبيع رجل معجوز طويل رفيع معصوب العينين يمشي منسربا لا حس له يحمل طفلا صغيرا لا يبكي يعطيه البائع الفتاة ملفوفا في ورقة صغيرة يضم الحامل الخشبي المثلث تحت ابطه ينصرف أحببت الوقوف قريبا منه أراقب يديه وجهه الجامد لم أذهب إليه بعد محلات الأكل كلها مفتوحة تسمع وأنت تسير أمامها باصطدام الأطباق والأوعية تتصاعد روائح الطعام السمك المقلي الفراخ المحشوة بالبصل السمبوسة وموقع رقيق العجيب يشكل في المثلثات المحشوة باللحم تقلى في السم حتى يحمر العجيب من بعيد ترتفع أصوات تدور وتتجه جماعة نجارين يركبون عربات تجراء التواب يصفقون يكبرون مهددين يرددون في إيقاع المنتظم ابن موسى ابن موسى لم أميز بقية ملا قلون من آل إلى آخر ترتفع صيحات هادرة عن جماعة تبتعد كلماتهم شاهدة مضطربة تغيب فجأة سمعت من يقول ابن موسى لا يأتي مرتين في زمن واحد رد آخر لو جاءهم من يصلح امرأهم لابد أن يخلقوا فيه العيوب العجيب 
أنني سمعت في الشمس رجلا عجوزا يقول بين دكان عطور قديم في الفرزاوي ظهور ابن موسى من علامات خراب الدنيا أنا أعرف عنه ما يقشع الأبدان لكن الحضور نظر إليه سكت لحظة فسابقوا في الثناء على ابن موسى كأنهم يدفعون عن أرواحهم أدم مكتوم ينفون استماعهم إلى العجوز أي أمر في الحي هذا؟ لم أرى اسمه في أي بلاد الناس تحب شخصا بعينه كل لسان يحمل سيرته يثني عليه في الوقت نفسه يسلي شيء خفي شعور لا يدين في الارواح والجماد رهبه خفيه من الزين لا تبدو على وجه بشر انما ترى بعيون خفيه هذا امر حيرني فعلا وهربكه سمعت قبل المنادي اذا That's where we end. Colossus. <laughs> uh, Colossus. <laughs> at the couple, uh, we need one uh, each time we're going to uh, stop. Thank you. We did it better than a couple. We will pound a little bit and we move on. Uh, so, um, we'll read the next passage. I miss. Uh, as you like. We're going to read a little bit more English and then. Uh, oh, yeah. So, um, we are uh, the trunk of an ancient tomb tree is encircled by an iron fence. A heathen city stones a hermit. Muslim Baghdad gathers around the high platform on which is Mansour, El Hussein ibn Mansour at Halaj. Men and women are swinging mud at him. The martyr tongue does not stop. I am the truth, I am the truth. The harsh hand rises, its arm covered with leather, studded with iron spikes. The whip comes crashing down on the thin body of the owner as master true knowledge. The executioner's hand gets tired of whipping, and the same's arms and legs are cut off, the smile on the lips of the pious hermit tells all that is apparent in that which is for His face is spattered with flowing blood on, the, on his arms, which doesn't stop crashing in conspicuous profusion. The sharp blade remo removes the tongue. During the night, the ashes of the burnt body are strewn over the tigers. The head is banished to Khorasan. Baghdad gathers. It drowns at the same in the sword. Time here is nothing but the continuation of those oppressive, long, bygone days. A viscous shadow that never leaves. Good is filled, evil is mastered, and prostitution rules. Where does one take refuge? What path does one take? An unexpected dilemma, one that one doesn't wish to have at the end. Zaid has been shaken to his very foundation. It embraces him. The noises of the city recede. How he needs to be away from it all. To surround the soul with a well of silence. To recall the faraway days in order to unlock the secret of the frozen smile while the arms and legs are gone. He would try to gather the ashes and ask the soul about that secret. Mansoor is gone, chased by the ghosts of the treacherous age. Mansoor is shaking, trembling. Perhaps he came seeking security. But what security? At the back of his neck are two eyes which nobody can see, which constrain his vision beside his path. Mansoor reports what the people are saying. Our master has chosen Zaini and supported him. What intercession can he hope for? If only he would shout the cry of deliverance and go. But where would he go? Undoubtedly, he would meet the Antichrist. Where? To the cellar that he has dug with his own hands. 
Mm-hmm. Is this the end of the road? Oh, he has fallen in a well planned ambush, carefully prepared by an evil Excerpt D from the Diary of the Italian Traveler Visconti Pianti, 922 AH, AD 1516. It seems that I have been destined during this, my third trip to the land of Egypt, to witness great events. Three days after I arrived from the Sudan, I went into the city. I heard that the Sultan had gone to Syria to fight the Sultan of the Ottoman lands. I heard the I heard the Muslim praying that, praying that the Sultan be victorious. I was told that Cairo had been shaken greatly on Saturday. I very much regretted arriving after the Sultan's procession at the head of his army had left, had left for Syria. And so that my compatriots would have missed the description of the procession, and to be honest, I am here quoting my friend Sheikh Muhammad Ahmed ibn Yes a well-known man of learning in Cairo and the author of a long history of the land of Egypt. I wish, if I had time, to introduce him to my own people. Ibn Ayas, despite his old age, watched the procession and wrote down what he saw. He has given me permission to copy what he has written. My friend Ibn Ayas says, Ibn Ayas? Then came the Sultan al Ashraf Kansu al Huri. He was preceded by the Caliph about 20 paces in caravan. The Sultan rode a bay horse with a gold saddle and saddle cloth, wearing a white barabat coat, embroidered with a wide border of gold on black silk. It was said to have in it 500 nitkas of gold. That day was of great splendor and magnificence. The Sultan was handsome and a fine figure in processions. Then came the royal flag, and behind him, the chief Mamluk, Sumbul al Asmani, accompanied by the armor bearers in full uniform. He entered Cairo by Zulayda Gate and passed through the streets in this awesome procession. All of Cairo trembled at his sight that day, and the people who had all come out, nobody stayed at home, greeted him with loud prayers for his welfare, their faces visibly shaking with excitement. The women cheered him by ululating from the windows. The Sultan marched in that cavalcade until it came out of the Nasser Gate. It was a day to remember. Um, see, that is uh, more. Did you pick up that uh, may God make this land secure on the river? Um, may God make this land secure. Strictly confidential. No human eyes should see this. A paper prepared on the occasion of the meeting of the Convention of Chief Spies in the Four Corners of the World in Cairo, Mother of the World, Garden of the Universe, to exchange views and review methods being used when others may be introduced, and to exchange knowledge and mutual benefits. This paper has been prepared in the Bureau of Spies of the Mamluk Sultanate and delivered by the Supreme Shaber Zakaria ibn Rabi. May God forgive him and acquaint him with his methods and ways. Cairo, Jumana, El Ola, 922 age. Fifth pavilion. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. God Almighty has said, Lo, the Lord is ever watching. God Almighty has said, Verily, God is the knower of things hidden. God Almighty has said, He utters no word, but there is within an observed ready. God Almighty has spoken the truth. The messenger of God, God's blessings and peace upon him, has said, He who believes in God and the afterlife should say good things or be silent. Amar ibn al may God be pleased with him, has said, Doctrine is like medicine. If you take too much of it, it will be detrimental. And if you take a little, it will be detrimental. Now, then, it has happened, it has never happened before that the chiefs of our profession from all over the world have met. This is an event of great moment. 
This is a big great event, a great moment in significance from which future generations will derive benefit and do and learn useful lessons. They will learn that we bore a heavy burden and paid an exorbitant price, that we've suffered in great anguish and sacrificed a lot for the sake of pleasing God Almighty. Our purpose in holding this convention is to find new methods and unknown ways to help with our difficult tasks, which will enable us to arrive at the heart, at the heart of the truth. This may make things easier for those who will come after us. We got help us. It so happens, due to the nature of our profession and conditions surrounding it, that we find ourselves in a strange position. This requires of all of us, from the chief spy who has control over the affairs of the whole state, down to the junior spy who trails the man or woman and who reports everything that is said in the gathering. Of all of them, it requires intelligence and astuteness. Each has to find ways and means that enable him not only to live securely among men, but also to be popular and well-liked. This might appear to be difficult. How can a man who by profession must peek into people's lives and their secrets and activities that is disliked be well-liked? How can he make people come to him for help with their problems? First, let's say. The size task, without beating the white bush, is to administer justice among the people. But he does so in a manner unacceptable to the people. Let's not observe the following facts. There is nothing in the world on which two people would agree. If, for example, we take this very hall in which we are sitting, away from the noise and the hubbub of the world, we don't all see it in the same way. The Supreme Chief Spy of India sees me standing here, while the Chief Spy of Yemen sees me from the left side. As for the Honorable Chief Spy of Sudan, he sees me from another angle in a different way. Even the interpreters see me in different manners and convey to your excellencies my speech but not my words, just the meanings. Hence, I have more than one form and shape, even though in reality, my posture has not changed at all and my speech has changed in the process of translation, but its meaning has remained the same. Thus, what we see as justice is seen by others as injustice and as a crime. A spy does not work for himself at all. In the first place and in the final analysis, the goal is to please God Almighty, then the Sultan, then the state. So long as the spy is a believer in God, be he a Muslim or a Christian or a Buddhist, he, shows, he spares no efforts to strengthen and protect the state. He's Come again. Men know the only thing for him are him. The heart of the Sierra will have him. Nadina Tun was the Nia Tun, Dorji Munesika. The other is them that tap for how the monastery in Iria to perform Mansour, and to say, get the Mansour and have met. الرجال والنساء ترمونه لوحات اللسان الشهيد لا يكف أنا الحق أنا الحق تعالوا اليد الغريبة ساعدوا مغطى بالجلد المرصع لخصوص الحبيب يهو الصوب فوق الجسد المحيد أدرك صاحبه الأحوال والفروع كلف يد الجلاد من الضرب قطع ذراعي الحسين ورجليه الابتسامه فوق شفتي العابد الزاهد توحي بالظاهر والباطن وجهه ملطخ بدم ذراعي المتدفق لا يتوقف لا يقف انما يتدفق من سخاء مبين ما المشفر الحالي ليتز اللسان في الليل انتثر رماد البدن المحروق فوق رجلة أما الرأس فنفي إذا رأسا فجمعت بغداد أغرقت الحسين بن المنصور ما الزمان هنا 
إلا امتداد هذه الأيام الثقيلة الناهية ظل لزج لا يروح أبدا الخير مسكوب والشر باهر والعمر طاهر إلى أي الأرجاء يرمي إلى أي السبل يلجأ حيرة غير متوقعة غير مرجوة في نهاية المطاف سعيد أرجف القاع أرجف قاع روحه أضعوه أصوات المدينة تتباعد ما أحوجه لا غيبا إلى إحاطة الروح بجدران الصمت إلى استرجاع الأيام البعيدة ليدرك سر الابتسامة للبنات بينما اليدان مذبوحتان ورجلان يحاول لم الرماد يسأل الروح أي سر أي سر انصرف منصور تطارده أشباح الزمن الخائن منصور يرتعش يرتجف ربما جاء ليلتمس الأمان لكن أي أمان في قفاه عينان لا يراه مخلوق تكبلان رؤيته تحددان طريقه منصور نقل ما يقوله الناس مولانا اختار الزين وثبت اركان فاي شفيع له المرتجى ان لو يطلق صيحه الخلاص ويمضي لكن الى اي حتما سيلقى المسيح الدجال الى اي الى السرداب الذي حفره باظافره اهذه نهايه المطاف سقط في كمين متقن اعده واد بعنايه Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kamal. I think we should uh, stop with the Arabic readings here so we can keep on schedule. But could, would you like to give us any final thoughts on um, writing uh, Zaini Barakat and, and uh, finding this kind of language? Hey, what did هو قال أن سنتوقف هنا بحكم الله عن قراءة هل تستطيع أن تعطينا أي أفكار عن كتابة قصة زين بركات؟ كتبت هذه الرواية عام ما بين عام 1968 و 1970 بدأ نشرها مسلسلا في مجلة روز اليوسف عام 1970 لكن في الحقيقة أن زي بركات تنتظم في مشروع روائي طويل يتعلق بالشكل وبالمضمون. Yeah, so uh, the novel was written between 1968 and 1970. It was published in sections in a magazine in 1970. But in truth, Zini Barakat is part of a long narrative project that I have. أولاً من ناحية المضمون زي البركات هي نتاج حقبة الستينات So as uh, for the content the now is in Barakat is the product of the 60s the generation of the 60s وهي حقبة مليئة بالتناقضات كان فيها مشروع وطني ثوري بقيادة جمال عبد الناصر لكن كان فيها قهر فظيع للحريات. So it was a decade full of discrepancies. There was a revolutionary national project led by جمال عبد الناصر that was also a period of political oppression. منذ طفولتي أنا مهموم بموضوع القهر 
ولدنا في ظل المراقبه البوليسيه رقابه من كل الانواع ولكن هذه الرقابه المباشره اثارت عندي موضوع القهر في اطلاقه. So since my childhood I was um, interested, haunted by the question of the political repression, I was dealt with, especially with the censorship. قهر سياسي قهر اجتماعي نتيجته الفقر طبعا ثم قهر كوني نتيجته الموت المحتوم وقدر لي بالكتابة أن أقاوم كل أنواع أنا في صراع مع القهر منذ أن ولدت وقد بدأت الكتابة عن السجن قبل أن أسلم كنت منظما في تنظيم يساري شيوعي صغير و تدربت على عمل المطاردة واكتشاف الرقابة في الشارع أو في الأماكن المختلفة ولكن عندما سجنت كانت لدي خبرة في السجن مما سمعته عما يحدث في المعتقل الكبير بالوحاب الذي ضم عدد كبير من الشيوعيين وبعض التيارات السياسية الأخرى. So I always had to, my interests are political repression, social repression because of poverty, universal repression, encapsulated in death. I, I, I always wrote to resist this version in various types of oppression. I wrote about the experience of prison before even being imprisoned. I was a member in a small communist organization, so I was well trained in the arts of escaping police, but at the end I still had uh, time when I was in prison. Uh, and that all of these experiences were formative in my life. <laughs> كان معظمها يدور حول تجربة التعذيب والاعتقال. وأذكر لأنني كتبت قصة سمعت سمعت عن تفاصيلها مما كان يصل إلي من المعتقل عن معتقل معتقل يساري تلقى خطابا من منظمة الإمينيسي كانت هناك منظمة دولية تنشر أسماء المعتقلين في ذلك الوقت وتعطي عناوين عناوينهم إلى شخصيات من العالم فبدأت علاقة بينهم وبين أنثى في الشمال من بلد أوروبي يعني هذه قصة نشرت في مجلة الأداب سنة 63 قصة أخرى اسمها القلعة كانت تدور حول التعذيب الذي يجري في القلعة وهناك رواية صغيرة سبقت الزيبا كاب غير مشهورة مثل الزيبا كاب اسمها الزويل الزوير عن تخيلت فيها وجود قبيلة على حدود مصر والسودان وهذه القبيلة تقصر الشباب الذي ينطلق للاكتشاف في الصحراء وتمارس عليهم قهرا وتطعمهم طعاما يسمنهم ثم يلتهمونه. 
الحكايات ودكيومنت يعني رجاء اوراق اجزاء عن المعلومات دقيقه جدا عن القبيله. اوكي يا So uh, I wrote a series of short stories before uh, Zee Barakat. They were thematically centered around torture in prison. I wrote a story about a detained leftist activist who was connected to amnesty uh, with a European uh, woman. Um, another story entitled The Fortress was uh, centered thematically around uh, torture. Uh, also, the, another short story called uh, entitled The Wheel about a tribe residing between Egypt and Sudan. And pre- pressing its youth and. Uh... Is there uh, uh, oh, one more thing? Yeah. Um, and uh, this uh, tribe um, was read by readers um, who believed that this, in fact, was a documentary history of the tribe. Um, and uh, uh, we're asking a Gamal about the tribe. And Gamal said, of course, that he made up uh, the tribe. But I heard Ostas Gamal that the Italian traveler, um, Visconti, documented this tribe as well. (laughs) 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 I I think uh, now we need to move on to the same barricade, otherwise we won't. Lose our time. بشكل عام أنا أكتب أو هذا تفسير هذا تفسير ربما لا يكون صحيح لكن كل ما كتبت ضد القهر ضد ما يدرس الإنسان ما يمنع الإنسان من القول من تحقيق رغبات القهر له مستويات واقعي رمزي اسطوري نهائي انا اعتبر الموت نوع من القهر لكن الكتابه اعتبرها فعل لمقاومه اي نوع من القهر خاصه المباشر السياسي البوليسي ولم ولم لم يعني عندما اجلس للكتابه لا اعرف باي سلطه والدليل هو هذا هو هذه الروايه كتبت في ظروف صعبه جدا يعني زي بركات كتبت في ظل رقابه وظروف دكتاتوريه ادت الى هزيمه كبرى في تاريخ المعاصر So generally speaking, all that I write um, for my project it was to, mili- is to militate against oppression in all its forms. Uh, what silences the voice of a human being and uh, degrades him. Uh, writing for me is an act of resistance. And in my experience, it's an act of resistance directly against police oppression. Zili Barakat was written in a time period uh, full of, uh, the atmosphere was full of oppression. I wrote it under censorship and threat. Uh, and this general atmosphere led to the defeat. I have written a lot in the history of the Mosque. I have written in the history of the Mosque. In the Mosque, I have written a lot of the history of the Mosque. I have written a lot of the history of في التاريخ المملوكي كنت اقرا ابن الياس والمقريزي واكتشف انه مستمر يعني ما كنا نعيشه في الستينات او التسعينات او حتى الان هو تاريخ مملوكي بشكل اخر ازاي آه بركات شخصية حقيقية ذكر في تاريخ ابن إياس وقد ذكرت الحقيقة في كل ما ورد في الزين بركات حقيقي وأذكر باعتزاز 
صديق عزيز جدا فرنسي يعتبر من اكبر العلماء بالتاريخ الاندوكي والعثماني الاستاذ اندري ريمون بعد ان ترجمت الروايه الى الفرنسيه قال لي يا اخي حاولت ان اجد خطا واحدا في الروايه فلم اجد انت دقيق جدا لكن هذا ليس هو العصر المملوكي انا فككت العصر المملوكي وأعدت تركيبه مرة أخرى في الزي بركة. So I am generally interested in the history of Egypt. I read a lot about ancient Egypt and I was just uh, estranged from this period. The language, the religion is different in the history of, uh, I read about the history of Mamluk Egypt. Um, I read about the oppression uh, that I feel stretches until now or the presence is a Um, it's a con it's, uh, the continuity of the, that time. Uh, Zini Barakat was mentioned in the historical uh, writing of Ibn Ayas, and I remember a friend, a historian friend of mine, once asked that I read your novel and looked for inconsistencies with that time, and I couldn't find. So I said to him that I uh, made the, in another historical research and deconstructed that period and found that it's, it's a, there's a continuation and, and the resemblance to our presence. طبعا انا خبير بالقاهره القديمه جزء منها مثل احجار اعيش فيها ودرستها واحفظها فكنت اضع خريطه امامي للقاهره القديمه في ذهني وانا اكتب الروايه ايضا انواع الطعام انواع اللبس العادات والتقاليد يوجد كتاب مهم في نظام الدولة المصرية المملوكية بكل التفاصيل اسمه صبح الأعشى في صناعة الإنشاء للقلقشندي وطبعا هناك مشاهدات الرحالة الأجانب الرحالة الأجنبي هنا يقدم رؤية بعيدة عن رؤية القاهريين او المصريين او المحليين يساعدوا في ايجاد زاويه مختلفه للرؤيه تجسد المشهد اكثر. So I I'm an expert in uh, ancient and um, the ways of life of the ancient Egyptians. I I know of Egypt too. I studied uh, I know about its architecture, about its food, about the clothes. Um, um, also, the, I'm interested in the accounts of foreign travelers because they present different angles of vision about the Egyptian life. Uh, <laughs> دخل إلى مصر من اليمن ومخ استمر الخلاف حوله 150 سنة. قرن ونصف حلال ولا حرام؟ الفقهاء يقولون حرام والصوفية يقولون حلال. لماذا كان الخلاف؟ لأن كلمة القهوة اسم من أسماء الخمر. ففي الزين بركات لا يوجد لا توجد لا يوجد قهوة الشاي جاء في القرن ال 19 يعني هنا في التفاصيل دقيقة جدا لكن في البناء كله متخيل. So um, uh, as a, as a... An evidence of the historical uh, research, you don't find in Zini Barakat a character who drinks coffee. Just because coffee was, was, was not, doesn't belong to the period, it's a modern drink that entered Egypt from Yemen, and at the time there was a big dispute about it with people who, were, who uh, were thought that it's halal, like allowed to drink, people who thought that it's prohibited, haram, and just because the, the translation of the word uh, coffee is tawa, and tawa in Arabic is another name for wine. Um, uh, Mr. Kamal, 
Um, we want to move on to uh, uh, Zafarani. Um, yes. So, so um, uh, one more thing. Sure. هشتاز <تصفيق> 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 على الأرض مباشرة يعني سبع شهور لا نعرف شيء عن العالم الخارجي لكن بعد بعد أن كتبت الزري بركات ونشرة بدأت المباحث تكتشف أن هذه الرواية ليست عن العصر المملوكي فاتصل بي أحد الضباط كان كان مسؤولا في مكتب الشيوعية قال لي يا أخي أنت تفهم شغلنا أكثر منا من أين أتيت بهذه الخبرة؟ فقلت له من الخوف عندما تخاف من شيء تفهمه أكثر من من يعيش فيه وتقاومه إذا كنت صاحب موقف والكتابة موقف يعني الكتابة أحيانا تكون في مواجهة قمع رهيب لكن على الكاتب الذي يريد أن يعبر عن الموقف أن يتخذ قرار الشهادة قرار الموت أنا كنت في أستدعى للتحقيق وكانت تمارس عملية يعني تعذيب بدني قاسية جدا الهدف منها هو أن المعتقل عند السؤال ينهار فكنت أتخذ ما الذي يريدونه يريدونني أن أعترف لن أعترف طيب ماذا نترتب على ذلك الموت؟ اذا انا مستعد للموت. فعندما يتخذ الانسان اقصى قرار ممكن يمكنه ان يتحمل اي شيء. شكرا. So I after undergoing an extreme experience of jail and torture. Uh, spent seven months, and um, like the prisoners, we spent seven months sleeping on the concrete. We know nothing about the outside world. We were tortured. After publishing the novel, people knew it is not about the Mamluki time. It became apparent that it's about our present time and torture and oppression. So once an officer uh, um, asked me, "You know everything about our work, how we like oppress people, how we uh, coerce them. Where did you get that knowledge from?" I answered, "It's because of fear." When you fear something, you know everything about it. And I had a long experience with prison and torture. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we, are, we are going to just read uh, very short passages uh, so that we can benefit from Ustaz Kamal's uh, um, uh, remarks. So we're just going to read only the very first part from the uh, Uh, the next script of Zabarala. So, we begin with uh, File 3, containing some of the quarrels that took place in Zabarala, some incidents and memorandum. First quarrel. About 10 a.m., the curly headed for a wife's room. As soon as he appeared, a number of inhabitants looked out of their windows. This embarrassed him greatly. From her balcony, whom Suhair declared that she had never liked or trusted that curly man, that she had always had her suspicions concerning those visitors of his. Those suspicions had been confirmed when his wife had kept to herself, despite the prophet's injunction that we look after our neighbors, even unto the seventh one. 
the previous year, some hair had gone upstairs to borrow a cup of oil, uh, but had come back before she had even knocked on the door, saying that her heart was not at ease. So hair was a pure, chaste virgin who had sensed the foulness and would not pollute her hand by shaking it with the floor. Um, so hair added that the likes of the curly woman pretended to be shy as if they had not reached puberty at the very smallest gesture, the flick of a hand or an eye would reveal the horror in all of its ugliness. Um, let's skip to me. Busta Lumena tried to hide a smile while his soul quivered as he was about to hear echoes of the old reality. The Sergeant Major was going to talk about his long history of service at the palace, his job as the bodyguard of one of the princesses, and his finally ending up as a cook at the royal palace, accompanying the king on his domestic and foreign travels, tasting the king's food. A few women began to arrive. Zanuba, the divorcee, pointed to a wife, saying, he has more honor than that one, just to refer to Kirti. Zanuba added that, just as the saying went, he couldn't handle the donkey, so he's come to punish the saddle. The sergeant major narrowed his eyes. That was no way to describe the shape. Takirli uh, interrupted her, saying he was going to reveal the truth about the wicked wizard. Hardly he finished when the sergeant major, his wife, Zanuba, and the children all started shouting at him. Uster Romana didn't understand what their protest was about. Takirli backed away. He'd never faced so many people before. The shouting that he was shouting that he was going to take measures that would amaze the alley. The sergeant major was provoked into shouting back, but do your worst. Zanuba made a pointed implication about the alley's desire to be rid of the pollution, and the children shouted and pointed at him. That's good. And we're going to skip now to the very last uh, a point on revolution after uh, this group in, in uh, the Zaporani district. Um, has gone through the adventures um, that are recounted in the book. And um, I will read this. It's called Revolution. Over the last few days, the waste the baker had conveyed several instructions from the shape to the people of Zafalana. Some of these sounded mysterious. Another seemed disturbing, even though the inhabitants had become accustomed to a number of measures that gradually changed their lives. Yesterday, Luis had announced that the Sheikh intended to reorganize Zafarani's, Zafarani's affair. Each inhabitant was to prepare to leave his house for another election. On the same day, Salam, the first warner, held a meeting to which he invited a limited number of Zafarani people, Atta, Hassan, Katsuri, Ahmed, Parvindu, and El Banan. He said that very soon, he would give them the good news. For in a short while, in just a few hours, they would find themselves part of the whole. The people of Zafarani would occupy the most prominent place in the world. It was not only to share his, this news, however, that he invited them to this meeting. He also wished to share some lofty ideas. He talked at length about the currents and path of human life and how some of those diverged from what man really wanted. What the Sheikh desired was to grant mankind the freedom of choice. He recited texts and read out lines revolving around the right to make new choices. Before the meeting ended, he asked Atta to communicate to Hassan Effendi and War, the Sheikh's anger and his failure to attend three meetings to which he had been invited. So it's got to you could just read any any small amount and then talk to us about Okay. about the, uh, this novel. Um, come up, come up. No. And as a foreign, what 
الزعفراني ايضا يمكن اعتبارها روايه ضد القهر. لكن القهر من نوع اخر. مستخدم في الدين و هي حاره هادئه في القاهره القديمه فجاه تظهر فيها حالات عجز جنسي. و يفكر كل شخص يعني ما السبب؟ أنا كويس، إيه اللي حصل؟ ف يجري يطوف منادي في الحارة يطلب من الرجال التوجه إلى الشيخ عطية. الشيخ عطية هو محتجب لا يظهر. وبعد أن يصل الرجال يعلن انه قد اعد عمل تلص يعني نوع من انواع السحر افقد به الرجال قدرته الجنسيه ما عدا واحد في الحاره ويبدا محاوله السيطره على الحاره بذلك كتبت الروايه سنه ايه 72 من 72 الى الى 74 المشاجره الاولى حوالي الساعه العاشره صباحا توجه التكرلي الى عويس بمجرد ظهوره اطل عدد من الاهالي مما سبب له حرج ومن شرفتها أعلنت أم زهير إنها لم ترتاح في أي يوم من الأيام بهذا التكرر. زوار أثاروا شكوكها وبما أكدها اختصار امرأته مع أن النبي أوصى على سبع جار. منذ سنة طلعت زهير لتقترض منها كوب زيت. عادت قبل أمها. تطرق الباب قالت ان قلبها قبض سهير بكر طاهره احست بالدرس لم تلوث يدها بمصافحه العاهره قالت انما في باب امراه التكلي يبدين الخجل كانهن لم يبلغن لكن يحدث ظهور حركه معينه ربما اهتزاز اليد رغفه رمش عند هزل يبدو العهر كاملا حمدت الله لان التكلي لم يساعد ابن اختها عندما رغته الحاق احد مراكز التدريب المهني لو كلم احد معارفه ربما اوذي الولد فيما بعد الست مسلمه تحدثت الى ام نبيله في نفس الموضوع يتقلم الكثير لي من عويس يلوح بالاصبع ما قاله اليوم سيحاسب عليه يمد يده ممسكا بياقته يصيح بعض الاطفال التكرر يضرب عويس بعض النساء ارسلن اولادهن لتتبع ما يجري اتقنوا ما عبد اليهم وصلوا درجات السلم الاول بدون ان يلحظهم التكرر إن صياحهم يثير عددا من السكان. ينزل الصوت سلام تتبعه امرأة يزعق قف عجلك يا فندم توهو. يطل الأسطى رمانا يتقدم ليخلص عويس. يعلن الصوت يعلن الصوت سلام هذا لا يجوز. يبلغ وجه التكري درجه من الاحمرار يخيل معها للواقفين انه سينفجر يصيح بلهجه اقرب الى الفرصه الى الفصحى متعجبا من دفاعهم عن هذا الضائع مما يشير الى احتمال تامرهم معه تهتز قامه الصوم سلام يطلب من التكري النظر الى الواقف امامه جيدا يزعق بصوت مرتفع يتناقض تماما مع هزاله الباب هل تعرف الى من تتكلم؟ لم يجب التكلم 
يقول لي السلام أنه جندي قديم من رجال الملك هل يعرف التكري معنى هذا؟ يحاول الأسرة رمانا إخفاء ابتسامة بينما تهتز روحه بزيوشه على سماع أحد ملامح الواقع القديم سنتطرق الصور إلى تاريخ خدمته الطويلة للسراي عمل كحرس خاص لإحدى البرنسيسات فترة من الزمن ثم استقراره طباخا بالقصور الملكية يسافر مع الملك في رحلاته الخارجية والداخلية ويتذوق الطعام قبله. شكرا. So, why is it that you translate the introduction? Yeah. So, the Zafarani Files was written a year after Zili Barakat. It can be considered a novel written against oppression, but uh, this time different part of oppression. The novel is a parable for religious uh, uh, repression in an old quarter of Egypt. Sexual impotence starts becoming a widespread problem among the men. The men flock to Sheikh Atiyah, for who has been hiding for help. <coughs> but it turns out that Sheikh Atiyah has made the magic spell that uh, made all men impotent, except for one to allow this particular one to have control over the whole court. Um, thank you. And um, we, we would like to come back uh, to you, uh, Ustaz Kamal, uh, for some uh, thoughts about uh, the language, um, a very different style you chose for uh, Zafaran. But uh, just to make sure we allow a little bit of reading from each novel, we're going to now read uh, just a bit from the third of our three novels, Tejeliyat, um, the Book of Epiphanies, um, which, as we'll see, is another completely different uh, world. So, um, we'll just read the first section. In the name of God, the beneficent mercy, I seek your forgiveness and approval, most forgiving and most generous. I return unable to be patient. For how could I be patient about, what, about that which has not been revealed to me? When my return was complete, I sat by myself, recalling and remembering his catastrophes of me. Recalling and remembering his catastrophes of me. I was in a state of total loss, unsettled and unhinged, both moving and still, even though earlier I had been more like a bird than a man, flying from branch to branch. Except now, it was the branch that was doing the flying away from me. I returned, bound after I had been unbound, confined after I had been free, to be confined, to be limited, and to be limited. I returned. I was both seeker and sought, lover and beloved. My departure had been to seek myself. My flight was from myself, within myself, to myself. I almost captured the secrets of the fire, the light, the night, the day, the sun, the moon, the lightning, the breeze of the east wind, the birth of the dew, the reverberation and the echo, the ultimate end the legendary beloved Selma and Rayla, the giving of the twilight, the succession of seasons. I was two boughs linked or nearer, but a veil of mist came over my eyes. I didn't have patience to wait. How could I bear that which I had to remember? I returned, having enjoyed the most beautiful time after my master had blessed me by allowing me to stay in his presence, after he had imparted to me knowledge of what I did not know. I returned after being away from family and home, after I crossed deserts and conquered obstacles, after all the barriers that humans normally cannot overcome had fallen before me, one by one. I returned even though I was given to constant travel, neither staying put nor settling down. I returned and I was loath to lose all I had seen. So I sat down and started writing, hoping to shed light on some of the things I had witnessed. In the 
process, I was sometimes crystal clear, giving all the details. And other times, I merely hinted and intimated them. Sometimes, I even obscured and held back. But after I got it all together and was almost done writing, a thought occurred to me to wash my hands of this weighty matter for fear of falling short, of being unable to be precise. So I made up my mind and tore up all I had written down, scattered it in the wind, and made it as if it never was. It was totally gone and forgotten, leaving no trace whatsoever. Although it had been there in black and white, I wondered, were I and my opinions not even there? At that point, all my determination was gone. My resolve totally evaporated. The blindness of memories engulfed me, leaving the bitterest taste in my mouth. Then all of a sudden, at that moment when the dawn broke, that mysterious voice called out to me, and then. I came to, and a bright light shone in the night of my soul, a light so unlike any other that I thought I had come back to the core of the radiant demon. At the heart of the light I saw three figures, and at a little distance behind them, another three, and right in the middle distance between them, a single figure. In the middle of the first three stood my beloved, the light of my eye, companion of my epiphanies, my refuge in hard times, the one giving me uh, succor in my missteps, my imam, a Hussein, master of martyrs. To his right was my father, and to his left, he led out the Nasser. As for the three standing behind, their features kept changing. At times I saw Ibrahim, Mezid, and Khalid. At other times I'd see my mother, my brothers, or my children, or my grandmother, an uncle, and some friends. A few of those I loved were those who showed who showed enmity toward me. Or I saw some persons that I had known for a long time, and some with whom I had been briefly acquainted, or even some I'd only glimpsed as I passed by a coffee house or looked up at the balcony. As for the one standing in the middle, I recognized him as my other master, as Sheikh al Akbar Muhaydin ibn Arabi. Al Hussein fixed me with a beautiful, piercing glance, so I was unable to speak. And yet I recited to myself, It's a wonder that I long for them and miss them even when they are with me. My eye weeps for them even while they are in his people. And my heart complains how far they are even though they are in my chest. The master of martyrs gave his permission, and the Sheikh of Akbar Muhyiddin in Arabi approached me. He took a step towards me even though he didn't move at all. I also did not move from where I stood, and yet there we were, face to face. We looked at each other for a long time in silence. Then I lowered my gaze, and we separated without uttering a single word. I had, however, understood and received the glad tidings, the light faded, they left. Yet I obeyed and began to commit to paper that which I had written before, and out of it came this book, which contains my epiphanies, interspersed within which are my voyages, stations, states, situations, and visions. It is a book that only those with understanding and hearty perseverance can understand. Should someone show signs of incomprehension or censure, I recite in the Holy Quran, He, Moses, said, So what have you got to say for yourself, Samaritan? And he, the latter, said, I perceive what they do not perceive. Thank you. Staff from that, Shukran. The Mulahas and the Kul Amak Lahu Boha and the يعني في النقد الأدبي يقال هذا الكاتب أسلوبه جميل وهو يحكي من نفس المعروف لا أنا عندي اللغة لها مفهوم مختلف كل رواية حالة خاصة وزي لغة الزيبرة التي توهم بلغة القرن السادس عشر لا تصلح لكتابة الزعفراني الزعفراني كانت تحتاج إلى تجربة لغوية أخرى 
اللي هي لغه تقارير بارده محاربه مختلفه في التجليات كانت مغامره جديده كل عمل مغامره كل عمل اقدام مات الوالد الوالد كان رجل فقير مكافح تعلمني فصعد عليا يتنسي يعني من سيذكر احمد بن طالب فبدات بفكره ان يعني اكتب عن حياته فوجدت ان العمل يتسع ويتسع ويشمل الكون استدعيت ابن عربي وسيدنا الحسين و... يعني اصبح عملا العمل الوحيد الذي لم اخطط له يعني في الزين بركات كنت استعد كاني اعد بي اتش العصر المملوكي التفاصيل الاكل اللبس القاهره الزعفران ايضا كان لها يوميات يعني اليوم انا وصلت لكذا لو سفندي بتغني لكن في في التجليات انا بدات باعتبارها فصل فصل يعني توجد انها تتسع وتقودني من مرحله الى مرحله استغرقت سبع سنوات كتاب Okay, we'll have uh, which do you have to do with uh, the summary? Yeah, so we, um, uh, we remarked that uh, every work of mine has a specific, it's a unique language, uh, it's written in a unique language, and against the unity of style, people say this writer, uh, this writer's style uh, is wonderful. For me, that's a weakness. Language is a state of mind that should change with every project, with every writing project. The historical tone in the language of Zini Barakat is different, for instance, from the distant modern voice of the reporter narrating the stories from Mohammed Zafarani. Um, in the book of Revelation, I venture into the realm of spirituality and my language follows. Um, in the Zini Barakat, the language reflects historical, my detailed historical research, um, as opposed to the language of Zafarani that is more about imagination and uh, uh, spiritual realm. طبعا التجليات فيها استفاده من الدين المصري الشعبي. دي في مصر بقايا في العصر المصري القديم الدين الفرعوني وفي تصورات ميثولوجيه وافكار لا يعرفها الا من عاش في مصر، لكن حاولت ان تكون منطلقا للروايه او للحكي او للتجربه، انا انا ضد الشكل المسبق، ضد اي يعني اطاره ان تكتب الروايه هكذا لا انا ما عنديش تكتب هكذا تكتب كما تكون فساضرب مثالا فقط عندما مات الوالد طب اي اذى انطوى لم لم يعد موجودا ذهبت الى الديوان الى الديوان ما هو الديوان؟ الديوان هو محكمة شعبية صوفية غير غير مرئية ترأسها السيدة زينب السيدة زينب شقيقة الحسين ومفروض أنها مدفونة في مصر يعني نحن نتنازعها مع سوريا لكن المقام المصري له اساس انها حلت مكان ايزيس في مصر المراه هي الاصل المراه هي الاصل 
ودائما هي التي المقدسه يزيس العذراء السيده زين لانه الاسلام ما فيهوش عذراء وما فيهوش امراه لكن المصريين بمفهومهم الخاص وتراثهم القديم اضافوا امراه سيدنا الحسين الشهيد هو خد مكان ازوريس و خد مكان المسيح و جاءت اتى المصريون بالسيده زينب واحبوها كما احبوا ازيس والعزم هذا هو الدين الشعبي الذي يوحد مصر ويوحد رؤيتها اكثر موضوع كبير لكن كيف استفدت منه في الروايه انا ذهبت الى الديوان حتى الان يوجد مصريون يكتبون رسائل الى رئيسه الديوان السيده زينب في مصر اسمها رئيسه الديوان ام العواجز ام هاشم رئيسه الديوان وام العواجز يعني نصيره الضعفاء هي التي تنصر الضعفاء وتستمع اليهم وقد كشف وقد كشف المرحوم الدكتور سيد عويس عالم اجتماع كبير ان المصريون حتى الان يكتبون خطابات الى السيده زينب والى الامام الشافعي لماذا الامام الشافعي؟ لان الامام الشافعي في الديوان هو قاضي الشريعه هو ممثل للاتهام يكتب المصريون رسائل عن مشاكلهم اليوميه عن 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 مشاكلهم في الحياه الى القاضي الشريعه لكي ينظر اليها ويحلها تلك مجرد خلفيه عن هذا العمل الذي امضيته في كتابته سبع سنوات مستنفرا كل معرفتي بالتراث المصري الشعبي والصوفي. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. عفوك ورضاك يا غفور يا كريم يا رب. فلما رجعت بعد ان لم استطع صبرا وكيف اصبر على ما لم احط به علما لما اكتمل ايابي فرغت الى نفسي استعيد واسترجع بينما زمن المحن يلوح ويبدو صرت في دوار لا تطمئن بي دار ولا يستقر لقراري قرار صرت متحركا وساكنا بعد ان كنت اشبه بطير اطير من غصن الى غصن والغصن الذي انطلقت منه هو الذي يطير عني والغصن الذي انطلقت منه هو الذي يطير عني عدت محدودا بعد ان كنت طليقا وكل محدود محصور كل محدود محصور وكل محصور عاجز رجعت بعد ان كنت الطالب والمطلوب والعاشق والمعشوق فلم يكن رحيلي الا بحثا عني ولم تكن هجرتي الا مني وفي والي ولم تكن هجرتي الا مني وفي والي كنت اصل الى اصلي كنت انفذ الى اسرار النار والنور والليل والنهار والشمس والقمر والبرق ونسيم الصبا وخلق الندى والرجع والصدى 
والغيان وسلمى وليلى واختفاء الشفر وتعاقب الفصول. كنت قام قوسين او ادنى لكن غش عيني ما يغشى لم استطع صبرا وكيف اقدر على ما لم احط به خبرا عدت بعد ان نعمت باجمل صحبه وانعم علي مولاي الرفقه بعد ان علمني بعضا مما لا اعلم رجعت بعد فراقي للفهد والوطن بعد ان قطعت اليابان واخترقت الحجب وتساقطت امامي كل الحواجز التي لا تقدر على اجتيازها الطبيعه الانسانيه وانا انا مفطور على الرحيل الابدي فلا استطعن لي اصلا وابدا رجعت فهان علي ان يتلاشى كل ما رايت فعتفت ودونت لعلي اتي مما رايت بقبس احيانا وضحت احيانا وضحت واحيانا فصلت واحيانا رمزت ولوحت سترت وما افصحت لكنني بعد ان امتلكت بياني وكدت انتهي من الكتابه خطر لي خطر ان افرغ يدي من هذا الامر الجلل خوفا من قله التحقيق وعدم قدرتي على التدقيق فعزمت ومزقت كل ما دونت شتكته ودربيته وصار كانه لم يكن صار نسيا منسيا صار اثرا مندثرا بعد ان كان مسطورا وتساءلت هل اتى علي وعلى تجليات حين من الدهر لم نكن شيئا وعلى اثر ذلك غربت نجوم عزائمي وفترت همتي ولفتني ذكريات دوامس واصبح اللعاب مرا في فمي وفجاه فجأة عند ساعة يتقرر فيها الفجر صاح بي الهاتف الخفي يا جماعة شكرا Friends, let me uh, uh, just close this remarkable a set of readings from Gamal and our, and our uh, my deep appreciation to our various voices who read from Baruch's translation. I just wanted to mention a couple of things that Gamal said at the end about writing uh, um, uh, these Kajeliyat uh, that took seven years. Um, that part of it began with uh, trying to memorialize uh, his father, what, how to come back uh, to that, uh, his attempting all uh, means uh, to uh, uh, be authentic to that effort, including his journey uh, to the Diwan. Um, there's a section in here that says an explanation, which gives an explanation of the Diwan led by Uh, say Isaiah. Um, I, I um, uh, would um, uh, uh, only end with a, a note about all the various allusions and um, uh, citations uh, from the Quran and from other uh, uh, literature that is woven into. Uh, this flowing voice, and uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, thank you again, Mr. Kamal, for your extraordinary, extraordinary generosity in sharing these readings and thoughts with us. Uh, we're going to have a, another panel in only about five minutes. We'll cut the break a little bit because uh, our next presenter, Cameron Cross, 
has a busy day. He's been teaching today. He'll be teaching. He's uh, offered to come in and share his work with uh, Ustaz Farouk on translating a story by Yusuf Idris. And then if there's time left over, I'll have some remarks on uh, authorial personas in the Nalarabi that might relate to what we just heard here. And finally, as a reference to the professorship of practice and as a guide to all writers, I'm not sure if you are recommending that after we have completed our work, we tear it into shreds, <laughs> throw it into the seven winds, and then um, wait uh, for it to be brought back to us and permission begin uh, to recompose it. Oh. Thank you. <laughs>